Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today on the What Does It Take to Implement MTSS webinar. Um, we're going to talk about finding professional development resources to support implementation of MTSS. Um, my name is Sarah Arden and I am a researcher at American Institutes for Research. I'm really happy to be joined here by um, two other experts who have a lot of knowledge about the resources that are available um, for professional development to support MTSS. Um, the first one is Kim Scow. She's meet, joining us from uh, to represent the IRIS Center. She works at Vanderbilt. Um, and she's going to be speaking about the IRIS modules um, and the information that you can find there. Um, I'm also joined with uh, Judy Letman, who is a senior researcher. You can stay there, Bezia, who's a senior researcher at um, American Institutes for Research, um, and she works on the Cedar Center, among other places. Um, and we're really fortunate to have her here uh, to talk through some of the resources that the Cedar Center provides. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, I'll be talking about some uh, resources that we have through the National Center on Intensive Intervention, the National Center on RTI. Um, this webinar is happening as part of Connected Educator Month. Um, there have been a number of components and webinars and uh, videos and uh, chats that have happened around this month. Um, you can see on this slide uh, the links to access all of that information, as well as the promises to keep um, documents that's being worked on and put out by the Cedar Center. So if you're interested in the other components that have happened um, and things that have gone on around Connected Educator Month, um, you can go ahead and go to that slide, and, and there will be links to take you to that information. Um, this next slide just shows you, again, who's here. Uh, it's myself, Sarah Arden, Kim uh, Scow, and Judy Littman. Um, so if you want to know who's talking, that's who we are. Go ahead. Um, so today's presentation, like I said, will just be an overview of professional development, um, what we know about professional development when it's successful and the components that might need to occur as part of successful professional development. And then we have a number of resources that we'll be going through um, to talk to you about. Um, these resources can support can uh, provide a framework to support professional development around implementation of MTSS. Um, and they're found in a variety of places. We know that uh, sometimes when you go looking for resources, it can be hard to pinpoint what you need or hard to find exactly where they, where they are. So um, we are going to be talking about the IRIS Center and some resources and modules that are housed within the IRIS Center, which is um, through Vanderbilt. And then as well as the Cedar Center, some course enhancement modules and other uh, professional development materials that are available through Cedar. And then we're going to talk a bit about the National Center on Intensive Intervention and our modules on database individualization, um, as well as the Center on RTI and some modules and training that are available through that center. So just a really, really brief overview. I'm sure many of you know um, a lot about professional development. You've uh, engaged in it. You've probably delivered it. And many of you have probably been participants in professional development. But what we know about professional development is that it refers to the skills and knowledge attained for both personal and career development. Um, it encompasses all types of facilitated learning. Um, it can be described as intensive or collaborative uh, and generally includes an evaluative stage. So some examples of professional development are things like training or technical assistance or uh, reflective supervision. Sometimes when you're a brand new teacher, um, you'll have a year or two with a mentor to come in and help you support, um, help support your new practice. That can be considered professional development. Things like instructional coaching, which we've seen a lot of um, in the last few years in education at communities of practice, professional learning communities, things like that. Those can all be examples of professional development. So when we think about professional development, we want to talk about effective professional development and what it looks like. Um, what we know, and I'm, I'm imagining that many of you have experienced this, where you're sitting and receiving professional development, but then it has very low levels of uptake. You don't go back and uh, commit to doing all of the components, or it's just another training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's what we'd like to avoid uh, in professional development. We know educators. Um, 
time is quite valuable and often quite limited. Um, and so when we talk about professional development generally, and also professional development more specifically to implementation of MTSS, um, what the research tells us is that to effectively implement professional development, training alone rarely leads to effective and sustainable implementation. And that word sustainable is really important here. We want to think about how you're going to develop your staff to go ahead and learn these components, but then also to uh, implement them with sustainability. Um, what we know is that professional development that's more dynamic or interactive or responsive to needs generally has more sustainability and is more effective. And there's been a little research done on that, which we're going to look at on the next uh, couple of slides. So this chart, and some of you may have seen this before, um, this chart is from Joyce and Showers, and it talks a bit about coaching and uh, the components that need to happen um, for implementation of professional development um, for those to be sustainable and effective. So if you look at that chart, um, uh, the column all the way on the left talks about the training components, and then the column all the way on the right talks about uh, using the skill in the classroom. And then in the middle, we talk about demonstrating the skill. So if you look at the very first box, when we think about just theory and discussion, so just when you're in professional development talking about what's going on, um, you can go ahead and see if that's the only component involved in the training, 0% use skill in the classroom. So we know that just sitting and receiving information is not enough. Um, when we go down that left-hand column again under training components, components, those get a little bit more intensive. So we talk about discussion plus demonstration, or discussion plus practice and feedback, or discussion plus coaching in the classroom. So when we look at how those build in their intensity of implementation of professional development, you can see then on the right-hand column how the percent of increase um, goes up for the skill used in the classroom and what sort of the value added might be. So theory and discussion plus demonstration plus coaching in the classroom we see a much, much higher, uh, you know, almost 100% increase um, in the skill being used in the classroom, um, as well as demonstration of the skill, as well as understanding the skill. So those are important components to think about when we talk about implementation of professional development. And so now we want to talk about why is professional development important to MTSS or RTI or tiered intervention systems of support, whatever it is that you call it in your state or district or local education agency. Um, so what we know, and this comes from research from a number of places, but um, what we know is that a lot of professional development needs to be provided at the very beginning or early stages of establishing RTI systems. So often implementation of RTI in, involves a systemic shift or systemic change um, within the way a school operates or within the way a climate or the staff thinks at a school. So we know that to front load very heavily on the beginning or the readiness of implementation of RTI or MTSS is quite important in making the work stick and making the work happen within a school. Um, it's important to offer a continuing job embedded professional development. And what we mean by that is job embedded happening on the job while you're in there working, doing this uh, implementation work that addresses these essential areas to effective implementation of RTI. Um, we're going to be talking through a lot of uh, resources that you can find. If that, if that speaks to you, if you're in an area where you're going, gosh, we really need to work a bit more on implementation. What do we do to be ready? Or maybe we've started this and we're not quite ready yet, or we've skipped some components. We'll be speaking quite a bit to that um, coming up. So we're going to talk about a number of places to find resources, and I've already said this, but we've got people here to chat with you from the IRIS Center, which has a wealth of resources um, on a variety of topics, but also on implementation of MTSS and RTI, um, as well as folks here from the CEDAR Center. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the Center on RTI and the National Center on Intensive Intervention. So those are just four really great locations where you can find resources for um, this kind of professional development. I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to, I believe Kim is speaking next, and she's going to talk a bit about the IRIS Center, um, the modules that are available, and um, the resources that you can find at the IRIS Center for this kind of professional development. Okay, well, before, uh, before we jump into the resources, I just want to 
give you a little background information about IRIS. Uh, we are a national center that serves faculty and professional development providers as well as independent learners. We develop resources for educators that address topics related to children and students with disabilities ages uh, birth to 21. All of the resources on the site, um, on our website, are free of charge, and there are no passcodes to get in. Uh, the only exception is um, an, a new section that we have where you can uh, get PD hour certificates, but otherwise everything else is free of charge. And we offer technical assistance and training to college faculty, PD providers, and independent learners. Oh, and do you mind advancing the slide? Okay. Now I'm ready to hop to the next slide, too. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, and this, the center develops an array of IRIS resources, um, like Sarah was saying, and these include our signature product, which are our modules, and we'll get into those a little bit deeper in a few minutes. We also have case studies, activities, information briefs, um, interviews with experts, and then two of our new resources um, are a searchable collection of over 200 video vignettes, and those are representations of classroom and instructional scenarios, as well as stories about individuals with disabilities, their family members, advocates, teachers, and service providers. And we also have a new um, tool. It's an evidence-based practices summaries tool. And that tool has summaries of research about the effectiveness of over 90 instructional strategies and interventions. And these summaries uh, distilled information provided by the What Works Clearinghouse website. And we've kind of taken what they have and have put it in a format so it's easy to discern what strategies are effective and which are not. And if you see some you're interested in, then there are links back to um, those uh, research articles about their effectiveness. Okay, on the next slide. Okay, we also have support and planning materials for faculty and PD providers. Uh, these include wraparound concept maps, which provide suggestions on um, support, supporting resources that can be used to extend the information that you find in our modules and case studies. So if you want to go a little deeper on a topic, uh, we also have sample syllabi, sample PD activities, coursework planning forms, and then answer keys to the module and case study assessment questions. Uh, these actually do require passcode, and if you're a faculty or PD provider, you can uh, email us or call us uh, to get that passcode once we verify that that's who you are, so students or participants aren't getting the, the answers to those questions. Okay, the next slide. Okay, and now just to kind of look at those modules a little closer, they are the signature product that we have. Um, they are grounded in learning research and are designed based on the How People Learn framework. Uh, and that's an adult learning theory framework developed by John Bransford and his colleagues. And the modules translate research into something that educators can easily read and implement in the classroom. So it's taken all that research jargon and turning it into some practical steps for teachers. Um, and the modules have been proven effective through our own research as well as that of others. Okay, the next slide. Uh, the IRIS modules incorporate the STAR legacy cycle to help us balance the features of that uh, how people learn uh, framework so that we are making sure that we're learner knowledge assessment and community standard and to get that all in there. And then each interactive module, as you can see in the graphic, is made up of five components. And then on the next slide, um, we'll go through each of those components. First of all, we start with a challenge. So that's usually a two to three minute video that presents a realistic scenario relevant to education professionals. And that ends with a couple of, a, a couple of questions which become our initial thought questions, which is the next component. And those questions allow students to explore and consider what they currently know about the scenario presented in the challenge. And it's a great way for PD providers or faculty to determine what their students or participants know about the topic and whether they have misperceptions that need to be addressed later on. Uh, the next component uh, is perspectives and resources. And this is where the content is housed. And we try to break that information up into nuggets of information that, that participants can easily grasp. So 
um, not a lot of dense text, but uh, that's broken into bullets or movies, audio interviews, graphics. And then we also include interactive activities that provide practice opportunities on different components. And then we have a wrap-up, which is just a brief summary of the content. And then the module ends with an assessment component. And that's an evaluation tool that offers students the opportunity to apply what they know and to evaluate what topics they need to study further. So if they need to go back, they have that opportunity. Uh, also, um, we find that many faculty and PD providers use these uh, as assessment questions to kind of see where students or participants are. Um, and then some independent um, learners are actually using them for PD credit. So they print those down and turn them into the district or school for PD credit. Okay, and the next slide. Um, as we're focusing today on multi-tiered systems of support, I did want to point out that we have a series of modules on RTI. Um, part one is just an overview of the whole process. Uh, part two, assessment. That really looks in depth at universal screenings, progress monitor, monitoring, and database decision making. There are lots of practice opportunities in there uh, to administer and uh, score probes and to make um, instructional decisions based on the data. Uh, the third, uh, third module in that series is reading instruction. And that really looks at the components of high quality reading instruction and how to implement this instruction at each of the different tiers. Uh, part four is putting it all together. So from beginning to end, what does it look like in the classroom before my class even starts? How do I prepare for the year? Um, how am I going to incorporate 45 or 60 or 90 minutes of reading instruction and get all the assessments in? So it really takes you through that and provides a lot of practice opportunities through that one as well. Uh, part five is a closer look at tier three, so what's really going on in intensive intervention? Uh, the next one is considerations for school leaders, and that one is, is aimed at administrators and how to effectively implement RTI school-wide, how you get buy-in from the staff, and kind of going back to what Sarah said a minute, a minute ago about uh, sustainable implementation. So it touches on that as well. And then RTI mathematics is just how, how is RTI applied to math, and that includes uh, instruction, assessment, and database decision making at the primary, secondary, and tertiary level. Okay, next slide. Okay, and the two modules I really want to focus on today are on database individual, individualization, and that's that intensive intervention. And uh, we are nearing completion on two modules, and we hope to have those posted in the coming weeks. And these modules were developed in collaboration with the Intensive Intervention Center and CEDAR. Um, and if you'll notice, there's part one showing right here. We've chosen to divide this into two parts because that process is so long and involved that we thought it would be easier to first talk about the steps in orange in the graphic, step one and step four. So to really look at intensifying instruction in part one, and then part two would go into those data components, which are the green ovals. But uh, the first, first module um, is going to open up with a challenge movie where the school intervention team is meeting uh, about Natalia, a fourth grade student who struggles with decoding and fluency and is reading at about an early second grade level. Uh, we quickly provide an overview of intensive intervention and database individualization. And then we really go into those different methods for intensifying and individualizing instruction. So we're looking at quantitative methods, uh, first changing the amount of instruction the student receives, um, and we talk about the benefits of that and how to do it. And then we go into a second quantitative method, which is changing the learning environment by reducing group size and grouping students with similar abilities together and reducing classroom distractions. And then if these easier methods don't work, then we talk about the qualitative methods that um, you can try, which uh, are combining cognitive processing strategies with academic learning to address deficits in memory and self-regulation and attribution 
So we're looking on that page at some evidence-based practices such as mnemonics and graphic organizers and note-taking uh, and the self-regulation strategies like self-monitoring and self-talk and goal-setting and those kinds of things. And then we also talk about um, a fourth method for adapting instruction that's modifying the delivery of instruction by altering the instructional approach. So maybe we're more explicit or we break things down more. Uh, student response, we provide opportunities um, for students to practice with feedback. And then that module ends with a step-by-step -step summary of Natalia going through the entire DBI process in each of these five steps with a real focus on steps one and four so we can look at the instructional adaptations. And embedded within this page and in that process are practice opportunities for you to make instructional adaptations and help her teacher make those. And we have feedback as well on those activities. And then throughout this module, we've got interspersed um, expert interviews with people like Rebecca Zumeta Edmonds, Sarah Arden, Sharon Vaughn, Steve Goodman, and Chris Riley Tillman. And then the next slide kind of highlights part two. And uh, this one, again, is going to cover those data uh, components, which are steps two, three, and five highlighted in green. Um, and the focus of this module is really on making database instructional decisions for those students who are receiving intensive intervention. And again, the module opens with a challenge movie where the school intervention team is meeting about Natalia, but this time they're a little more concerned about the data component. We give a quick uh, review of intensive intervention and database individualization. And we provide those step-by-step -step procedures again uh, for collecting progress monitoring data and analyzing that data. Uh, and then we go into diagnostic assessment, how to conduct those. And we really focus in on error analysis for reading uh, and how to do that, and then also error analysis for mathematics. And on each of those pages, we have practice opportunities uh, for analyzing the data from those different error analyses. And then this module, again, ends with that step-by-step -step summary of Natalia going through the process, with this time a greater emphasis on those uh, data components. And there are practice opportunities for analyzing the data and making database instructional decisions on that page. And again, we have expert interviews with uh, people like Rebecca uh, Zumeta Edmonds, Sarah Arden, and Devin Kern. Okay, next slide. Okay, and that was just a really quick overview of our resources. But if you have any questions or would like more information about the IRIS Center or, or the resources we offer, you can call us or email us. And all this contact information is available on our website. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah now. Thanks, Kim. Um, I actually think the next part of our presentation will be Judy um, speaking about uh, the resources that are available through the Cedar Center. So um, we can advance to the next slide, and I will pass it over to Judy to um, talk about Cedar. Well, I wanted to introduce everyone to the Cedar Center. Um, for those of you that do not know what Cedar stands for, it is the Collaboration for Effective Educator Development, Accountability, and Reform. And a little bit about the Cedar Center, it was um, funded by OSEP for five years. Um, there's a, between a cooperative agreement with the University of Florida. Um, it began in January 1st, 2013, and it provides intensive technical assistance to 20 states. The mission for CEDAR is to create an aligned professional learning system that provide teachers and leaders effective opportunities to learn how to improve and support core and specialized instruction in inclusive settings that enable students with disabilities to achieve college and career readiness. So that's a little bit about um, the CEDAR Center for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. So the next slide. Um, so the objectives that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, um, although the Cedar Center has an abundance of resources, what I'm going to concentrate on today is to really tell you a little bit about our course enhancement uh, modules, um, <clears throat> as we refer to them as the, the SIMS, which I'll refer to them going forward as our SIMS. 
they um, are very helpful in preparing students with disabilities to achieve national standards and career readiness. Next slide, please. Next slide. So basically, the, the SEMS, we're gonna, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the who, what, where, why, and how, um, so that you'll get a, a deeper understanding. I actually posted the um, Cedar Center website um, under the chat room. You will certainly get a much better understanding of them when you go onto the Cedar Center website, and there you will also find um, an abundance of our other resources as well. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of them so that when you actually go on the website, they'll be, you'll really understand how they're, they're laid out. So next slide. So basically what they are, they're really a, copy, um, a compilation of immediately usable and adaptable materials, activities, and links to online resources that focus on different instructional and behavioral topics. Um, they're designed to provide teachers and leaders um, with support materials, again, to prepare students with disabilities and those who struggle to meet college and career ready standards. Next slide. Next slide. So each, um, each of our um, SEMs are, are or were developed um, by a team of con content experts, and they were vetted through a uh, very strict peer review process. It's taken us a while to get them online um, because of this um, very uh, strict process that they went through um, to get them online. Next slide. So each SEM is, is very involved. Uh, they are, uh, they contain um, a lot of information. Most of the information you will find in the facilitator's guide. Uh, the facilitator's guide actually consists of the anchor module PowerPoint with a script uh, which will support the facilitator as they present the content and learning activities within the anchor module. Uh, the facilitator notes and talking points are included, and the speaker notes are intended for a guide for the facilitator who is using the PowerPoint. But the nice thing is is that they can be modified as needed. They do not have to be used verbatim as written, um, so they can certainly be adapted to um, as needed. So the anchor uh, module itself is the central um, resource in the course enhancement module, and they're designed to be utilized as part of a pre-service um, prep course or, or a professional development program for teachers and leaders. Um, the anchor modules are designed to build the knowledge and capacity of educators on selected topics, and you'll see the topics that we have um, built the SEMS around. They are adapted and are flexible, which I think is really important and beneficial and useful for uh, faculty and professional development providers. Um, the speaker notes are very um, informative for the people that are presenting faculty members and professional development um, people for resources. Um, there is information and resources included included in the modules that can be integrated within um, courses or programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, materials are also included in the facilitation guides. Uh, handouts are included. Multimedia um, is included. And also additional references um, are included in the facilitation guides as well. Um, it's recommended that um, people using the uh, course enhancement model review the facilitation guide before they actually um, use the course and use the SEMS. So next slide. So currently we have um, 
course enhancement modules available in uh, disciplinary literacy, behavior management, and UDL. They're actually already available on the CEDAR website. Reading and math should be available in November, December. They're just uh, still being finished, uh, being vetted. Um, they're very close to being put up, and we anticipate that they should be online by November, December, the latest. So look for them. Under construction, we still have a writing um, SEM under construction, as well as severe disabilities, and also uh, leadership is also under construction, so they should be coming soon. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the intended audience um, is teacher and leader candidates within pre-service programs at the undergraduate or graduate level, as well as district teachers and leaders participating in in-service professional learning um, opportunities. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I do my volume here. Okay, one more. Keep going. Okay, so <clears throat> SEMS are um, based on um, their evidence base. They draw on evidence base and research based practices or promising instructional practices that help facilitate academic learning for all students. They are aligned with multi-tiered systems of support. SEMS are not meant to be implemented in their entirety. Um, only pertinent parts or um, tiers um, will or should be implemented. Each PowerPoint um, within the module can be a standalone um, and, again, should be used as appropriate or as needed. Next slide. So other reasons um, that SEMS can be helpful, they are informed by the national standards. They include engaged adult learning and multi multimedia. Each uh, SEM PowerPoint ends with case studies that can be discussed, um, data provided, and um, facilitates a lot of good uh, discussion. They're flexible in the way that they can be used, as we've talked about before. Next slide. So how are they organized? So they are organized in um, tiers, as we discussed before. Um, I think these are somewhat out of order here. Next slide. Okay. So they're organized in the tiered organization. Um, part one um, is an overall introduction. Part two is uh, universal um, interventions, which talks about core instruction. Part three of each SEM talks about supplemental interventions, and part four talks about intensive interventions. So each SEM is organized the same way. Okay, next slide. Okay, where are the SEMs located? Next slide. Um, so here's the CEDAR website, and again, it was also um, in your chat box, but I encourage you to actually Go to the CEDAR website, um, take a look at the SEMS. This will bring you right to the SEMS. But there are other resources um, on the CEDAR website as well, which I think that you will find um, very helpful. Okay. Next slide. That might be the end. Next slide. We have a few testimony from the from the field people that have actually used the SEMS. You can read that at your leisure. And that's just a brief overview. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and
move it back to Venza. Thank you, Judy. This is Sarah again. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the National Center on Intensive Intervention, um, the DBI training series we have, and then I'm going to also talk about the National Center on Response to Intervention. Um, go ahead and advance. And so the National Center on Intensive Intervention, or NCII as we often call it, um, is focused really on intensive intervention or uh, Tier 3 or that DBI. Um, we're going to use those terms interchangeably right now. Um, focused on implementation of intensive intervention. So when we talk about intensive intervention, we specifically mean intervention that is designed to address um, severe and persistent learning or behavior or learning and behavior difficulties. Um, we intend and we assume that these inter intensive interventions are driven by data and are characterized by increasing intensity um, and individualization of the academic instruction. So we think of this intensive intervention sort of as an iterative process marked by progress monitoring, uh, intensive um, intervention, intervention adaptations, and then continued um, progress monitoring. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about DBI um, and that there are going to be two modules on intensive intervention, um, specifically on DBI on the IRIS Center. Um, but there's also a wealth of information on DBI and on intensive intervention on our website. So this is the National Center on Intensive Interventions website. Um, our mission is to build both district and school capacity to support the implementation of DBI, um, specifically in mathematics and behavior and in reading um, for those kids who are your most intensive, um, the ones that have those persistent learning needs that you just can't quite figure out what to do with. Next slide, please. So DBI, um, like I just talked about, um, is a validated, uh, is a, as an iterative approach um, that operates on the assumption that validated intervention programs will happen. That would maybe be what you call your tier two interventions. Progress monitoring occurs, um, and then there's some kind of diagnostic or academic assessment that's done to identify what a student is really struggling with. Intervention adaptations are made, with, followed up by continued progress monitoring. Um, we intend it, and we see it as an iterative process, not as a program. Um, and so there's a lot of information on DBI, both what you will find coming in the IRIS modules and also on our website. So this um, image that you're seeing here is taken directly from our website and it's interactive. And I'm going to show you a little bit later where you can find more information if you'd like to look up um, what does Tier 2 mean or you don't know what diagnostic or academic assessments are or functional assessments, how you find some training materials and some potential professional development resources to address all of those components. So more on that in a second. Go ahead and advance. Thank you. So um, on our website, um, we have a series of DBI training uh, modules that, oh, can you go back one? Um, a series of DBI, sorry about the, it, sometimes this technology gets a bit jumpy as we advance and go back and forth with slides when we present it to so many people. So um, thanks for your patience around that. So on the National Center for Intensive Intervention website, which you'll see um, the link to down below, and I also believe it's been sent out, um, you're going to find a series of DBI training series and DBI training modules. Um, this is a screenshot of a number of them. I actually think there are about eight or nine of them up. Um, these are designed to support your school teams or your district teams um, or those folks, whoever it is, that are involved with the initial planning or implementation of DBI. So we talked a little bit earlier about this um, professional development being really important in the front end, in the, in the readiness uh, section. Um, so there are um, a number of resources here, and you can go on to the next slide, that help really uh, provide a framework for that. And I believe Amy just sent out um, the link uh, to the uh, intensive intervention modules in the training series if you're looking at the chat box. Um, so for example, this would be what you would find in one of the modules. Um, so when you go to the DBI training modules, say you were to click on this one, module seven, um, that's looking at designing and delivering intervention for students with severe and persistent uh, academic needs, you click on the module and you will find these components. 
Um, the PowerPoint slides exist for you. Um, the PowerPoint slides with notes. So if you were to deliver these as professional development, someone could download the PowerPoint slides, find all the speaker notes. They're ready there for you and scripted and ready to go so you could learn the material. Um, they are also uh, all of the handouts that we refer to in the PowerPoints are listed and included in here in PDF form. There's also a sample agenda if you were to do this and a coaching guide. Um, all relevant materials that are pertinent to the module that you click on um, are included. So they're ready to go if someone would want to pick them up and start doing training on implementation of CDI. Um, so here is just a nut, some more um, pictures of what we just talked about in the DBI modules. The PowerPoint slides with the speaker notes, you can see all the way on the left-hand side. And then embedded handouts that in, are included in what we talk about in the presentation, but are also ready to go and take away for any staff that's receiving this professional development. Um, and then coaching guides to support implementation. So like we talked about earlier, uh, professional development where you just sit and receive the information, sometimes called sit and get, is not always effective. Um, we talked about job embedded professional development and the importance of following up and coaching. So in addition to the modules, we also have coaching guides that should help support the implementation and the work done around these modules. Next slide, please. So like I talked about earlier, this graphic um, or sort of thought of as a bird's eye view of DBI is on our website and it also links right back to some of our DBI modules. So if you're wondering about modules on diagnostic assessment or intervention adaptation, um, you can click on these components and it'll take you to modules. There is a module about readiness, so getting ready to implement. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, starting to implement intervention and where do we get modules on that and this would be the link these will take you to where you go we also have some modules on considerations for your site your staff your building about what do you need to consider and think about before you implement um, RTI or before you implement uh, I'm sorry um, intensive intervention or DBI next slide please thank you um, so, for example, if you're wondering about secondary interventions or tier two interventions, you'd like some training on that, you feel like that's an area where your staff needs some support or some training, you can go to our link, go to our website, go to this uh, graphic, which is right on the home page, and click on the validated intervention program box at the very top, and that's going to take you directly to the module on secondary interventions, or setting the foundation for intensive support. So they're connected right away. You don't have to do a lot of searching for the information. Next slide. The same thing exists for both progress monitoring and other aspects of DBI. So if you're wondering about progress monitoring um, and you want to talk about what is, what is that, what does that look like, how can I do some training with my staff with that, you can click on that green progress monitoring oval on our website and it is going to take you directly to monitoring progress for academic and for behavioral interventions within a DBI framework. Same exists for diagnostic assessment, so this is the same process. If you're wondering about that, you click on diagnostic assessment, it'll take you directly to the modules. We have these both in academics and in behavior, and the academic ones both address reading and mathematics. Um, so if you dig around in there a little bit, you'll be able to find those resources. Next slide. In addition to the DBI uh, training modules, we also have a series of webinars not that different from the one that you are listening to now. Um, webinars can really uh, support and um, enforce the training that happens in the DBI modules. Uh, you wouldn't have to necessarily listen to all components, um, but they can be supplemental or can supplant some of the material within the DBI modules. Um, you can see the list on the right-hand side of all of the webinars, or many of the webinars, I actually think there's more than that, um, that are listed on uh, our website. And when you click on those, you are gonna go ahead and hear and find the webinar. You can download it, and so you can just have access to the slides, or you can choose to listen to it as part of the professional development that you provide. Um, it also includes answers to all of the frequently asked questions that we've received during that webinar. So that can be really helpful if you've listened to it and have some questions. It's a good place to look to find that information. Next slide. 
And then in addition to the webinars, we also have these what we are calling Ask the Expert videos. They are short, they're two to eight minutes, um, so nice for engaging intention or getting people um, interested or engaged in the activity that you are providing. Um, they supplement and can sort of address some of the more frequently asked questions we receive on intensive intervention. Um, they can be embedded into trainings or professional development. Um, and so they're sort of like our frequently asked questions. So if you look maybe at the third one down, um, you'll see that there's a question about what's the research and its implications on early intervention and reading. And we've talked to Rolando O'Connor, and there's a quick video of her answering that question. The same exists for a variety of questions and a variety of answers. Um, those are really great to supplement the DBI training modules if you need them. And now that we've kind of gone through what's on the National Center for Intensive Intervention, I also want to talk about the Center on RTI. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Some of you might be familiar with the Center on RTI. Um, the Center on RTI was funded a number of years back. It's also housed within American Institutes for Research, same as the Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, when this project was refunded, um, it was sort of changed into the next iteration, which is the National Center on Intensive Intervention. So the Center on RTI, um, still houses a wealth of information, especially around readiness um, and preparation and thoughtful work on implementing RTI generally. And then when we go to the National Center on Intensive Intervention, we talk a little bit more about database individualization or Tier 3 resources. Um, so the Center on RTI is another great place to find information. Um, I specifically had someone ask a question about secondary schools, middle schools, and high schools earlier. And if you go to the National Center on RTI, which is what you're looking at now, um, under Resources, which is the third tab over on the green bar, you're going to find a whole section related to secondary schools, middle and high schools. For, so for those of you asking um, questions about that, that's a great place to go. Next slide. In addition to um, what I just told you about middle school and high school, um, our, the Center on RTI has what we call an implementer series, um, sort of like the modules that we've talked about or the SEMS or the IRIS modules, um, the training modules. This is another place that information like this exists. Um, so the RTI implementer series is intended to provide foundational knowledge about the essential components of RTI. Um, and to really start to build an understanding of the importance of this kind of implementation. Like we talked about earlier, we know that this is where we really need to front load the professional development. Next slide. So the implementer series has um, kind of two components. It has a, a series of training modules, and it also has a series of self-paced modules. So if you just wanted to go through this information to learn on your own and you weren't delivering professional development per se, you may want to look at the self-paced modules. Um, they're based on the content from the training uh, modules, and they're really intended for individuals or teams to learn at their own pace. So maybe your school team wants to just do this on its own. You're not providing professional development, um, but you want to receive the professional development. That's definitely one way to do it. Um, and then... Uh, there are also a series of training modules that are intended to be delivered um, by trained professionals. They provide overviews, and they focus on applying the knowledge and analyzing school and district data for RTI. Next slide. I'm just going to stop here really quickly. Um, I saw a question about asking the difference between RTI and DBI, and so before I move forward, I want to clarify a little bit. Um, Data-based individualization, which is what we talked about um, a little bit in the IRIS modules, but also in the National Center on Intensive Intervention modules, um, can be thought of the intervention that happens with the most intensive kids. So kind of the iterative process that happens within the third tier, if you will, or with those most intensive inter uh, kids. So RTI, um, or some people call it MTSS, which is often inclusive of um, behavior and academics, but the names are used interchangeably in many places, um, can be thought of as the entire process, and DBI can be thought of as a process that embeds within it. So what you do then for your most intensive kids who have gone through an RTI process, who have received secondary intervention, and who haven't responded, DBI is a process that at the National Center for Intensive Intervention um, we think should occur to really support those kids with really severe and persistent needs. 
So continuing on, um, now we're talking about the National Center on RTI and the Implementer Series training. Back a slide, please. Thank you. Um, the training modules really address the components of RTI. So we talk about screening, we talk about progress monitoring, multi-level prevention systems. Generally speaking, this is foundational work on RTI. There is a series of links at the bottom. You can see the screenshot that will take you to, again, like we said, PowerPoint handouts, um, PowerPoint presentations, slides, training um, manuals, and videos. Next slide, please. Thank you. So all of these have um, a training manuals that go with them. Um, and the training manuals, um, these are for those where you're going to implement the work on or do the work on the RTI Center, um, provided as a professional development. Um, this training manual, manual, I'm sorry, provides an overview of content, the handouts and activities that are included, glossaries of terms, frequently asked questions, related research, related websites, a whole wealth of information. If you were to present this one on screening and what's involved in screening, it could be used as really a standalone. You could take it away and do uh, the work that's in it and, and feel pretty supported in that you've got access to a lot of great materials to support your training. They also have facilitator guides, and these facilitator guides support all of the training modules. So similar to what you saw in the SEMS, similar to what you saw maybe in um, National Center on Intensive Intervention, uh, these facilitator guides on the center of RTI really connect to the ongoing professional development. They give you training checklists. They give you a review of the structures. If you're going to be presenting this information, a facilitator guide is a great thing to look at to prepare you um, kind of for your scope and sequence of what you'd like to do and how you'd like to do it. Um, these exist for all of the training modules on the National Center on uh, RTI. Next slide. Thank you. And then, like I said before, there are the self-paced learning modules. So if you self or maybe your team or some folks just wanted to do some personal professional development and learn about this information, um, you can see here what's, what exists within the self-paced learning modules. So there's components of each. There's introduction. We talk about screening, progress monitoring, and multi-level systems. Um, and then we talk about all these components um, that go with each one. So those exist as well. If, if self-paced learning is the way that maybe you just wanted to take some time and learn about this, um, that would be a great way to do it. It also could be a good way to do it if you were the one delivering this professional development and you wanted to learn a little bit more about what you were presenting beforehand. Um, it would be a good way to do a little brush up for yourself. I know that might be something I would consider doing if I were to deliver all this information and then move over to the other set of modules. Next slide. So here's what's in the self-paced learning modules. These are just screenshots of what you'll see so we can prepare you. Um, if you were to click on the introduction, um, it'll talk to you about what is RTI. And then it says, you can see there, the learning module focuses on developing basic, basic understanding of RTI. There's a module, there's PowerPoint presentations, handouts, and a training module, module that goes with each one. Um, so you can see the components. There's some in PDF form and then some in uh, PowerPoint that you'll receive as you go through the self-paced modules. There are also implementer series videos um, that go with each of the self-paced modules. So um, you can, for example, this particular one is on assessment, um, and it shows a video about what's, what's in it. You get a transcript of the module, the PowerPoint slides, um, and those sorts of things. So there are really a lot of resources here and a lot of components you can click on and learn from and choose to do. Great as a brush up. Um, great for those of you that maybe be put, maybe are pushing for why implementation of RTI is important on your site. This could be a really great wealth of resources for you to look at and seek out um, to support your position on why this kind of work is important um, to make happen. And then, like I said, there's additional training modules as well, center resources, um, implementing effective literacy practices. There are training modules on a whole series of professional development um, content areas that you may want to look at around RTI. So um, if you go, there's a link at the bottom, I think Amy might have sent it out, um, about uh, the resources and what's, in, what's uh, included in the training modules. So that wraps up kind of our overview of just a few places that you can find resources. Um, we went through four, um, and I think what you'll find there are quite comprehensive 
um, and supporting sort of wherever you are in implementing MTSS. So if you're particularly in a place where your site is starting to implement it or thinking about it or trying to figure out if it's going to work for you, especially maybe some of you at secondary schools where this work has just really started to emerge in a lot of places, we've got readiness and we've got um, sort of thinking about implementation modules. There are a wealth of those resources both on CEDAR and on IRIS for um, continuing your education around where you are um, in implementing uh, RTI or DBI or MTSS. If you have questions about, you know, we're, we've been doing this work and now we're looking for functional assessment or I need to really beef up my knowledge on progress monitoring. Um, there are places that you can go to on all of these sites that should support you kind of at any way, any place in your process, and also if you're presenting professional development um, as part of this work, these should support both of your personal knowledge and also your ability to provide the training. So that being said, I think we have answered most of your questions that have come in um, on the chat box and in the question box, but I'd like to go ahead and open it up um, to... Uh, the rest of you to see if there are other questions that we haven't answered or anything that um, you haven't asked that you'd like to uh, get addressed. Um, someone just asked about behavior charts for middle school students. Um, when you go into the DBI modules um, that we showed earlier where it talks about um, progress monitoring for behavior, um, there are a wealth of resources there for behavior um, charts and behavior modules. And, and Kim, you may want to speak up too, and I'm not sure if they exist on CEDAR, if there's particular um, information about behavior on either of those websites. Um, this is Judy. Um, you might want to check that the behavior SEM is online at the CEDAR site. Uh, go ahead and check online at uh, the behavior SEM. You might be able to find some information there that you can use. And this is Kim from IRIS. We also have a series of behavior modules. Um, I don't know if they address the particular thing, but really talking about classroom management all the way up through addressing disruptive behavior and then uh, functional behavior assessment. So those are also located in our resources section. Um, someone just asked about a list of tier two academic interventions. Um, on the National uh, Center for um, Intensive Interventions, there is a tools chart that you will find, and that tools chart, um, I think it's at the top of the website. If you just go to the uh, intensiveintervention.org, you can find it, or maybe we can send out the link to where the tools charts are. Um, the tools charts connect you to a number of resources around academic and behavioral progress monitoring um, and interventions um, for uh, a, a list of a number of them across grade levels and across content areas. So that would be a good place to look for that. Um, there's another question about um, structures for student support teams, and I know on the National Center for Intensive Intervention, and, and again, Judy and Kim, please feel free to speak up. Um, we have, if you look at um, under the uh, teaming, I think it's called database team meetings, or there's a, you can just look up team meetings on the website. Um, there are a whole series of resources there um, that talk about student team and meetings and agendas and scripts and um, documents that can happen to support teams building those meetings and having those meetings around students. So um, we have a lot of those there. Some of them are in PDF and some of them are in Word in case they want to be changed or tweaked um, for your district for however you um, need to use them. So we have provided sort of a guideline um, intended to be maybe a jumping off point. Um, I don't know, Judy and Kim, if you have anything to add to that.
Um, and then there was another question that we saw about um, running records and progress monitoring. Um, we have a wealth of resources on progress monitoring and tools that can be used for progress monitoring. Um, we don't uh, specifically say what you should use. Um, the National Center on Intensive Intervention, anyway, doesn't promote a particular program or a process. Um, but there is a wealth of resources on the different kinds of progress monitoring tools that you can use um, and what's available. We always suggest um, that you use something that's evidence-based and um, research-backed uh, for your progress monitoring that's valid and reliable for the kinds of students that you use. Um, there are also a number of um, slides that address running records as progress monitoring, um, and those are in the um, presentations that were given at uh, Council for Exceptional Children last year. Um, so we can put up the slides, um, or put up the link, I'm sorry, to where those slides are. I think it was in the second or third one of those presentations where we talked specifically about running records and is it progress monitoring and should you use it and what should you use from the data from a running record. Um, so there's a lot of information there for you. And this is Kim from the IRIS Center. Uh, we also have a couple of modules on progress monitoring. They don't touch on running records, but they really kind of go through step-by-step step how to uh, conduct progress monitoring, and those are called classroom assessment. And once again, those can be found under our resources section. Um, well, we're coming uh, to a close here. Um, we're coming up on about an hour, and I'm thinking that we have addressed many of um, your questions. I'm trying to scroll through them to make sure. Um, some someone asked if the PowerPoint will be um, will be access, uh, accessible on the website as well as the transcript and the recording. And the answer to that is yes. Um, it takes a little while for us to get all the resources together and the recording and all of our information, but that will be posted. Um, so if you want to hear the recording to go um, to go listen to our conversations and us answering the questions, um, we'll also post in writing some answers to your frequently asked questions, um, so you'll have access to all of that. And I think um, with that, um, we really appreciate uh, you joining us. We appreciate your um, questions and um, you letting us know that you use some of these materials or um, asking about where you can find other materials. Um, we really encourage you to look around on all of these sites on CEDAR with IRIS, the National Center on Intensive Intervention, National Center on RTI. Um, to find some resources, and if, and if you're not finding what you need, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I think our contact information or information for most of the sites and the, and the people on this webinar were in this PowerPoint, um, but you can always reach out to us on any of the, of the websites that you're at, and, and if you have questions or are looking for something that you just can't find, or you feel like there's something that you could really use, um, let us know, because we're always in development of new materials. We always want to hear kind of what is being used out there and what feels like it's helpful and how you've done professional development around it. So um, we really, really appreciate um, that information. Um, this will be posted on the link that's in this website. It will be posted under the webinar section of the National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, so if you're looking for that, as soon as it gets posted, that's where it will be. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, and I, I'm not sure if there's a link to it on the next slide, but you can sign up for our newsletter at the National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, I'm not sure if there's one specific to CEDAR or to IRIS, um, but uh, you can sign up for our newsletter and it will also um, send you out all the information um, that we have and what's coming and what's being posted. I don't, is that available on um, IRIS or CEDAR, IRIS or CEDAR, Judy and Kim? It is available on the IRIS Center, so at the bottom of our homepage, there's a link to join our newsletter. And um, once again, it, it also is just to inform you of what we've recently posted. So, okay. Awesome. And well, that being said, oh, I'm sorry, is, Judy. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is on Cedar as well. Okay. So a wealth of places to go to find resources. I apologize. Didn't mean to interrupt, Judy. Um, and that being said, I think I'll go ahead and, and end our webinar today. I really want to thank you for your time, um, for joining us, and, and for the work that you're doing around professional development in this arena. Um, our work wouldn't be useful without your work. So um, we appreciate you, and thanks again for the great questions and for your participation.